It's a heroic building. It's an engineering institution. It's turned the idea of a typical building in Lima, in Peru, totally around. It is also a building that doesn't necessarily represent perfection in the usual way that we are used to. In the midst of the jury discussion, we actually looked up civil. And it means of the citizens. How people in a place relate to, engage in, use, and grow because of what that building does. And that's where the UTEC building stood out. I think it also has a message for architects working all over the world to be innovative about how you think because we need to address larger issues than simply style and form. The world faces so many serious problems, be they social or environmental, and we feel as architects that we can assist in dealing with these issues. Bonsoir, guten Abend, Joestet, buenas sera, good day, it's universal. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Royal Institute of British Architects. My name is Alan Valance. I'm the Chief Executive of the RIBA. Before we start, a couple of points of housekeeping, if I may. We don't have a fire drill organised for this evening, so if you do hear the fire alarms, Please follow the exit signs through to Bridford Mews or to Portland Place at the front of the building, but our team will help you out. Uh, mobile phones, please leave them on, but put them on silent, vibrate, and tweet as if your lives depended on it. Thank you for joining us this evening and for showing so much interest in our international prize. It's great to have such a mix of different people here, from students, graduates, academics, journalists, and of course our architects and fellow professionals. And I understand some of you have travelled a long way to be here too. Welcome to you all and season's greetings. The RIBA International Prize is a new initiative for us, but its aims are true to our core values. The RIBA's original charter in 1834 sets us the task of advancing civil architecture. Advancement may not be a word we use much these days, but the notion of civil architecture, or architecture that is for the people, was perhaps the most important criteria of the international prize. In turbulent times, the power of architecture to create better lives, to improve conditions for people, and to generate social prosperity and economic wealth is a uni universal shared force. We hope the prize demonstrates that. Tonight, we'll hear from Grafton Architects, whose project, the UTEC campus in Peru, exemplifies these qualities. But I know the judges were struck by the sheer breadth, the scale, and the commitment all of the entries demonstrated to architecture as a force for common good. In a moment, you'll hear from our jury chair, Richard Rogers, who will perhaps say a little bit more about the qualities of the building itself. But I just wanted to offer sincere thanks to all the architects and the clients around the world who took the time and the trouble to enter their projects and to host our nomadic jet-setting jurors. The response we've had has been absolutely incredible and bodes well for the future of this prize. It falls to me to offer a few thank yous to our partners, without whom the prize would not have been possible. Firstly, our media partners, to CNN for their unstinting commitment to the international prize and for their extensive coverage throughout the process which raised the profile and the reach of the prize considerably, online to some 29 million people. Thank you to our friends at Design and Wallpaper for their coverage also. Thank you to our media partners Flint, PR. For what you've all achieved in a short space of time, we're truly grateful. Thank you also to Microsoft, our exclusive technology partner, for supporting this prize and for pledging their commitment to the RIBA. I also want to extend thanks to all of the fellow institutes and organisations around the world who supported the prize by helping to identify potential entries and assisting with the judging. Without you, the prize would not have been possible. 
Finally, my thanks to our members for supporting the prize, either through judging, through joining us here tonight, or supporting our awards. You may be interested to know that today we launched our call for the UK Awards for 2017. It's come round again, how quick. Your support of awards and all of our programmes is what drives the RIBA forwards. RIBA war awards and RIBA membership are the hallmarks of excellence and you don't need to be an architect to join. Speak to me or to any of the staff around here tonight about getting the most from membership or indeed about joining and getting involved. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't get that plug in. Our membership team is on hand tonight on the first floor to help you out. In a moment then we'll hear from the jury chair Richard Rogers and then from the prize winners themselves. But first it's my very great pleasure to introduce to you the president of the RIBA, Jane Duncan. Thank you very much, Alan. Good evening, everyone. The RIBA has always shone a light on the talents of architects from all over the world. The Lubetkin Prize and the Sterling Prize rewarded the skills of architects on a global scale. And the International Prize is very much in a long tradition of looking beyond our borders to identify, to celebrate, and to learn from what's happening in architecture across the planet. Inspired by that heritage, our awards group and awards team, under the joint leadership of Philip Gemerchen, our awards group chair, and Tony Chapman, our head of awards, until his retirement earlier this year, set out to create this prize three years ago. So tonight is very much the achievement of their vision, and I offer them both my thanks on behalf of the RIBA. In the first year of the International Prize, we were delighted to receive entries from all over the world and of all types, scales and levels of complexity. Each demonstrated the skills and abilities of the architects involved, a very high and inspiring level of global architectural achievement. 21 buildings were identified as the winners of awards for international excellence, ranging from a Centre for Contemporary Arts on the Azores archipelago to an ambitious vertical social housing scheme in Singapore and a remote house in British Columbia commanding its place over the Pacific Ocean. All were visited and all were subject to considerable scrutiny by our panel of judges, who not only generated air miles, but also generated considerable insights along the way. Amongst the 21, John Lynn and Joshua Bolshova, who are otherwise known as Rural Urban Framework, stood out in our emerging architect category for their imaginative and thoughtful research-led project to Andong Hospital in China. We were delighted that they could join us here in November to receive their prize and to tell us more about their work. The range of building types and cultural and social influences that our jury considered made the task of the awards group a particularly complex and challenging one. But a short list of six had to be found, and by early October, that list was reached. It was then up to our intrepid grand jury to go out and see the final six with fresh eyes. Under the guidance of Richard Rogers, our grand jury of Kunle and Adeyemi, Marilyn Taylor, Billy Zen, and Philip Gumujan set out about the task with amazing commitment and resolve. Their experience, pedigree, caliber, and most importantly, their stamina for a whistle-stop trip right round the world were truly beyond compare. During the visit, each jury member was struck by the craftsmanship, the flair, and the consideration that each architect had invested in their projects. Perhaps what this prize demonstrates is the ability of architects and architecture to transcend political and economic boundaries and to raise standards and aspirations, whatever the context. Reaching a decision on the winner was an invidious task, but what stood out about Grafton's UTEC building in Lima was the way it redefined the area, the idea of a campus building, and, and it responded so well to the unique 
topographical, climatic, economic and social pressures inherent in their brief. As I'm sure Richard will agree, it is a worthy winner and I very much look forward to presenting Grafton with their prize later and hearing from them in more detail. Lost my place now. Oh, there we are. This is an easy one. So that's enough for me. And now it's my great honor to introduce the, chair, the chairman of this year's grand jury. It is Richard Rogers. Good evening. I clearly haven't changed my pulver since the jury. <laughs> <laughs> I was approached by the RIB, by which I suppose I mean Philip Kamuchkin, excuse me, chairman, <laughs> chairman, chairperson, um, and asked whether I would be interested in participating in looking for a world-class building which we could win an award, which was not British, which was not limited, but was global. I know quite a lot about competitions, one way or another, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But I thought, this is an impossibility. How are you going to deal with a few billion people, a billion or so buildings, and even if you limit it to contemporary buildings, how are you going to do it? On the other hand, I know Philip well, I know the RIB very well. So there was a bit of trust, only limited, but there was some trust. <laughs> Phil then told me, well, we're going to have to see the buildings. And I said, I'm afraid it's not going to be me in which case. I'm happy to chair it, I'm happy to look, but I can't travel around the world uh, at this time, at this moment. So Phil again said, as he very persuasively talks, he said, we'll find a way around it. Been, Phil and I have been finding our way around it for the last 40 years, probably. So things continued. Now, my, um, and again, I have to congratulate the RIBA, but my amazement in a way is not just that it's been done, but the fact that the RIBA backed this crazy idea. Um, the first time I gave a speech here, 40 years ago and more, I think I was asked by Peter Shepard, who was, a, who was the then coming in president of the RIBA, and he wanted someone from, sort of from the left, um, who was a bit mad. And he asked me to sort of be one of his talkers. And I remember, the funny part I remember, I said, well, I was, amongst the things I said, was I think really what the RIBA should do is sell this building and make some money and spend it on design. Didn't go very far as we're all here. <laughs> um, I think the next time I remember, Michael Manch asked me whether I'd be his deputy chair. I lasted for about three months. And then the one thing we didn't talk about, the three meetings or two meetings that I attended, was anything to do with architecture. It was very much more a drinking club, an evenings out club. An administrative club, but it sure wasn't architecture. This has changed immensely. Now, there's a heritage, the gold medal and other things have been really the primary awards in the world for very many years. But at that time, I thought, this is not for me. I'm not good at this sort of thing. So I, with Michael, who I loved greatly, I stepped, I stepped back. I was delighted to get involved again in a, in a most daring concept, because how in the world do you make a choice? What is it for um, size, for importance, for what was, well, how were we going to choose this building, or buildings, or complex? What sort of, what were the parameters? Beauty. I remember well when I was chairman of the Urban Task Force, and being taken to the side, to one side by John Prescott, the deputy chairman, who was my boss when I did this, and say, look, you can't use the word beauty and be taken seriously in the, in the corridors of power. Ever since then, I've been using overtime beauty. <laughs> <laughs> it 
But still, it doesn't exactly define what you're looking for. Now, as architects, we probably know, and probably I'm not just as architects, we know that what we are looking for because there are certain parameters, and it has been going on for 6,000 years, architecture. Um, and in a sense, or more, uh, I suppose we are thrown back on knowing, using what knowledge we, ha uh, we had, or we have. So the jury got together, and we talked about how we would do it. We talked about competitions, and again, I'm something that I've done quite a few of. I was fortunate enough with Renzo to win the Pompidou Center, which was probably the most unpopular building ever, ever, ever thought of for the six years that it was going up. We didn't get one piece of press. Actually, we, I lie. We got Ada Louise Huxtable in the New York Times. That was the sole piece of media, which was positive, until the doors <laughs> opened and things changed. Even with Lloyd's, which we also won by some miracle. Um, and I sort of wheedled my way into the opening, because I sure wasn't going to be asked by the, uh, to the opening. And uh, nobody else was asked from my team, from the engineers or anybody else. And I remember I sat next to the Dean of St. Paul's and he said, are you feeling beleaguered? I said, yeah, that, you could say that. And he told me a wonderful story, which I use, and I'm sure those architects who are here might want, wish to use, which was, Ren start, started build, designing St. Paul's when he was just under 40. He built it when he was just over 70, 40 years. He was continuously turned down. There's some wonderful models in the crypt, by the way, which is well worth seeing, and probably the better ones are in the crypt. And in the end, he got so fed up by being attacked for not being, be, for being too contemporary, I modern, for his time. I keep on telling this to Prince Charles, but he doesn't listen. <laughs> um, and he, he, so when it came to what I he obviously realized was in his 70s, it was the end of his life was coming. And when he was again asked to rebuild and redesign and rebuild, he built an 18-foot wattle fence all the way around so nobody could see it from, until it was too late. And I've often thought, I really, we should all build wattle fences around the buildings. <laughs> it, was a wonderful, yeah, it was a wonderful concert to realize that, not the one suggesting one's Wren, but that the architecture is often hated, and at the same time, once it's there, it's often loved. And is, there's nothing more important than shelter. Late of late, I've been doing some competitions, and I've been losing the usual. I remember Norman Foster once saying to me, how many competitions do you think, this long time ago, that you do to win one? And I said, 10. And he said, God, you're an optimist. <laughs> Which I am. You have to do many more than, than that. But the last competition I did, nearly the last, was for an extension of the LSC. We had won one before. But once more, we were beaten by Grafton Architects, of all people. <laughs> so I know them well. <laughs> I wear a little cross. <laughs> it's a wonderful building that you've designed. I think it's correct for the place. It's correct in terms of scale. It holds many of the things that I love. It offers the possibility of flexibility. It offers the possibility of change. It's full of light and shadow. It's a form of open grid. It is strong, and it is, as the president mentioned, it is in the right place. Now, Lima is a wonderful city. I know it pretty well. Peru is even more wonderful. But it will be a real addition to that city. Now, the jury had, as often, its arguments. And I am argumentative. You may not believe it. And we were ended up with, I remember, three projects of the six, but they were all very good. And I remember well because 
One was amazingly daring. It was of the present and the future. It was world shattering. Another one was totally invisible, and no one could convince me because I hadn't seen the buildings that it was an invisible project was something I could accept. Another one was yours, which I could understand. And if I'm delighted to be here at this moment, I'm delighted that you won it. Congratulations, and thank you all for coming here. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Yvonne Farrell, and Shelley McNamara is on the other side. We would like to thank Alan Valance, CEO, President Jane Duncan, Lord Rogers of Riverside, Richard Rogers, each member of the jury. It is a great honor for us to be here this evening celebrating the first or IBA International Prize. This prize means so much to so many people. First of all, we would like to thank our client, Eduardo Hochschild, for his educational vision and belief in architecture. Carlos Heron, UTEC CEO. Our Grafton team. Our local architects, Alejandro Schell and Rafael Mispereta. The design team including Klaus Bode and his team of environmental engineers, our structural engineer, Carlos Garzabon, project manager, Alvaro Mina, and the contractors, Grana y Montero. What is extraordinary is that this project has happened. It's amazing when fortune aligns and something is born. This project began in the dreams of education to make a new university in the city of Lima. Being convinced that an international architectural competition would be the way forward, involving the architect Freddie Cooper, Eduardo Hochschild began a process that has brought us here this evening to share our story with you. Eduardo Hochschild is very sad that he cannot be here this evening to accept this wonderful prize with us. He and his representative, Sir Malcolm Field, wish to come to the RIBA president and to, at a later stage, to personally express their appreciation. For us, the story began when we decided to do the competition on the other side of the earth, in a country we did not know. One of our architects in our office had spent time in Lima, and she told us about the people, the place, the climate, and their wonderful food and we listened. Lima is a desert city, 12 degrees south of the equator, and this means that it should be extremely hot. The city is beside the Pacific Ocean, and a cold current from Antarctica drifts up from the South American coast or along the coast, cooling the city of Lima, keeping its temperature constantly in the 20 degrees Celsius, and this current is called the Humboldt Current. Fog is formed, which captures light, and we've discovered that fog refracts light, intensifying it so that when it captures the back of your eyes, it's nearly painful. The Humboldt Current, which is so called, after Frederick von Humboldt. He was a man who sailed out from Lima in 1803, having spent a number of years enthralled by South America. This incredibly intelligent human being produced this wonderful drawing on the screen, which is called Naturgemälde. It's an untranslatable German word, which roughly means synthesized nature, or all things connected in nature. The genius of this man is that he took the then contemporary historic data, 
which was made up of several and separate lists from the various disciplines. And in a radically new way, he made this beautiful drawing, which depicts complex data in one simple way. We talk about von Humboldt with you this evening because we argue that in the same way as he realized that each point on the earth is unique and connected, this touches us in what we call, and we have named, the physics of culture, dealing with sustainability and place as integrated, calling on architecture and architects to research, value, respect, and heighten local conditions in the making of contemporary work. Lima is a city that has 40 meter high cliffs against the, uh, against the ocean um, that form the edge of the city. The site for the, contempt for the competition was in a type of valley, in from the ocean, on the edge of a district called Barranco. It is a city of over 10 or 12 million people. Like many cities in South America, it is a city of extremes. But Peru is also the place of Inca gold. And on the right-hand side is a thing called a quipo. Quipo were strings which were used to record it was a record, a record keeping device through which complicated system of knots made of wool or cotton strings fastened to one another, each held together by a cross cord, and each were different in size and color. This simple and compound making of knots and their size and color represented details of their lives, crop measures, thefts, deaths, and possibly events. And the carved stones of Machu Picchu make stone feel like soft cushions. Each stone is carved three-dimensionally to interlock, forming anti-earthquake bond. The man-made terraces articulate a mountain slope, transforming nature. We're very aware that we're standing here in London tonight. It's interesting for us to think that when the Incas were in Machu Picchu, your great Sir Tom, Thomas Moore was writing Utopia. It was first published in 1516, 500 years ago. In Adrian Forte's book, Concrete and Culture, it, he takes as his starting point Thomas Moore's descriptions of the houses of the Utopians, where, and I quote, Moore had imagined, long in advance of its invention, a perfect cement-based building material that would transform people's lives. Not only does Moore's description mark the beginning of a long-standing association between concrete and utopian movements of all kinds, but it makes clear that concrete has a metaphysics as well as a physics, an existence in the mind parallel to the existence in the world. We began to think about this competition. We made sketches. We sketched the cliffs, the valley, the busy motorway on one side, a residential district on the other. The educational requirements for this brand new university included large laboratories, smaller laboratories, libraries, offices, etc. We thought about stacking these rooms with the bigger rooms on the lower levels corbelling so that the roofs of the bigger rooms would become the terrace gardens of the smaller ones above for students and staff to enjoy. We imagined a man-made cliff with the edge strong enough to withhold the motorway and the busy noise of traffic, while the cascading garden terraces would mediate down to the neighbouring residential district of Barranco. We thought about a breeze from the Pacific, we thought about the cliffs, the 40 meter high cliffs. And we thought about education. We wondered what a brand new university in the 21st century could be. We asked ourselves a question, could a university be an arena for learning? If this new university is to be in Lima, where the temperature is pleasant, with no need for waterproofing or insulation, an architect's dream, constantly in the 20s, Celsius, could this affect the type of architecture that we could consider? Would it affect the type of spaces that could be made? We looked at the work of Mendes de Rocha and we analyzed the structure of the undercroft, imagining it as a place of social um, overlap full of potential. 
We admired the work of Artigas, his immense structures and the blurring of boundaries between inside and outside. We admired the work of Neve Brown here in London and that ma magnificent project of Alexandra Road, a kilometer long, also dealing with the railway close by. And the Braga Stadium, beautiful stadium by Eduardo de Soto, uh, de Soto Bora. We had all our architectural lives being influenced by the thinking of Le Corbusier and Brazil and North Africa, and also experiencing one of North America's absolutely beautiful treasures of architecture, the Salk Institute by Louis Kahn. Not only the wonderful space that was made better by a conversation with um, Barigan, where he convinced Louis Kahn not to plant it, but to make it this um, incredibly empty, solid void of La Jolla. But also for us, it began the competition in terms of our free section. So you're in a seismic area and you're in uh, Lima. This is the drawing for the competition where we have based the larger rooms at the lower end of the uh, section. You move up through the, to the building with the bigger laboratories, smaller laboratories, making new ground, teaching spaces, moving up to the, to the sky allowing the space to move through and educationally connecting so that the choice that we made in the overall assessment of the brief, that some rooms, yes, would need air conditioning, but most of the accommodation does not need air conditioning. In a place like this, all circulation could be outside. So instead of making three buildings, it's a phase building, a phase campus. This is for phase one, two, and three will be built later. So this is really saying, that we, this image from the competition is an educational section where students on the bridges as they move from one uh, lecture to another also view into the, um, into the laboratories and see what else is happening in the campus. On the left hand side of this image in the city of Lima and surrounds are things called huacas. And huaca comes from the Quechuan language of languages of South America and it's a word that means something revered. It's typically a, mon a monument. The, it's made of uh, clay. They're really clay pyramids built forming staggering platforms, probably ceremonial or administrative centers. This is made from one material. You can still see the finger marks of the people who made these bricks, these handmade bricks that form these immense structures within the, within the city. On the right-hand side of this image, of the previous image, and on this one here, you're seeing the, uh, us taking the material of the 40-meter cliffs, interpreting them in terms of the uh, concrete, and it allows us to make this uh, drawing from the competition, which has the base in the city, and the fog is uh, disintegrating the upper parts of the building uh, into the sky. And our conviction, I suppose, parallel, is that architecture is the new geography, developed through a body of work of ours and others, reflecting what is happening in the world around us. And as we look at our uh, structural models and see the plan, really what we're saying is that the busy motorway on the, on the north really bounds the, uh, at the edge of the site, which is 350 meters long, by placing all the main public rooms on the lower level, we allow a new plaza to be begun and the beginning of the uh, complex of the university itself. On the lower left-hand side, you see the diagram of this uh, banana or um, uh, can, uh, yeah, banana-shaped site, which phase one is uh, completed, but the other phases, as we said, will be placed later. The reason for discussing the new geography again in this image, which was part of the exhibition organized by uh, Sir David Chipperfield in the Common Ground Venice Biennale, where really what we're saying is that as more and more natural world disappears, what we do as architects means that we are affecting more and more of the world, that we are making not individual objects, not whether they're beautiful or not, but by the sheer amount of building, architecture is now at a scale of the Earth's geography. In the world, architecture plays a significant role, so much so that the architectural writer, Peter Buchanan, says that we're so immersed in it that place, 
places made by architecture, that it's hard for us to describe it like fish in water. It's hard for us to fully appreciate the impact, the medium in which we live, to fully comprehend the role of the spaces between. So we use the term architecture as a new geography in an effort to try and understand the magnitude and impact of building, where even the smallest projects add something to the Earth's crust and can change people's lives. In terms of the, excuse me, I'll just get this here. In terms of, those two pieces I just want to uh, read with you, which we find really very important. The image on the left-hand side is Machu Picchu, and on the right is Skellig Michel, which is part of like St. Michael's Mount or uh, Mont Saint-Michel in France. These are places, uh, intimate spaces in immense conditions. And on the left-hand side, when I want to describe the words from Paolo, um, uh, Pablo Nuera, who, the, the Chilean poet. When he went to Machu Picchu, it changed his life. The impact of building on, on his life was really enormous. Using his words, he said then, there was no highway and we rode up on mules. At the top, I saw the ancient stone structures hedged in by tall peaks in the verdant Andes. Torrents hurled down, down from the citadel, eaten away and weathered by the passage of the centuries. White fog drifted up in masses from the Wincamayu River. I felt immensely small in the center of that navel, the navel of the deserted world, proud, tire, towering high, to which I somehow belonged. I felt that my own hands had labored there at some time in the remote past, digging furrows, polishing the rocks. I felt Chilean, Peruvian, American. On those difficult heights, among those glorious scattered ruins, I found the principles of faith I needed to continue my poetry. Sir David Attenborough, on last Sunday evening, in the last series of his Planet Earth 2, said that in 10 years, an area the size of Great Britain disappears under the jungle of concrete. And he continued in his own words, he said, now, over half of us live in urban environments. My home is here too, he said, in the city of London. Looking down on this great metropolis, the ingenuity with which we continue to reshape the surface of our planet is very striking. But it is also sobering. It reminds me just how easy it is for us to lose our connection with the natural world. It is, end of quote from... David Attenborough, we would like to say that it is this connection with the natural world that we want to emphasize with the UTEC campus. Ocean breeze, educational topics, equatorial sun, shadow, fog, landscape, people and plants and birds. We see architecture as modified earth. Um. Continuing on from Yvonne's description of the physics of culture, uh, and Yvonne, this is your image, so I'll make up what you're going to say about it. <laughs> I thought I'd test you out. Um, we, 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 one of the way that we, we work, we've developed in the making of work, is to think about a strategic way of thinking as opposed to, uh, let's say, a compositional way of thinking. And we really explored that in this project, partly to do with the scale, partly to do with the fact that it was uh, phased, but also to do with the kind of looseness and the open-endedness that this kind of way of thinking leads to or that we hoped it would lead to. And one of the things that we really aimed for was this idea of making a very open, perforate kind of structure, which would allow the city to, 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 uh, to find its way through the building, the life of the city, that somehow it wouldn't feel like a barrier or an outside and an inside. And so this image on the left was really, I suppose, our way of thinking about making what we called a piece of social infrastructure. 
And then on the other hand, one of the things that we really believe in is the capacity for architectural space to bring people together. That somehow when you're in uh, this space with this kind of grandeur, that it makes the individual feel like they're part of a grander order, part of a, a bigger world. And I think that's something that we as humans all want to feel, but also in an educational institution, that you have the community of the uh, educational institution, and you also have the individual. In, in this image, these diagrams made to, to modulate the, uh, the, the, the heat of the sun and the glare, we see the building leaning towards the north, where the sun comes from. And this was done in a scientific way, trying to see how we could make this microclimate which would feel good. And I suppose one of the things that we love about architecture is thinking about not just how the space looks, but how it, how it feels. So we were thinking about the wind and the, and the air and the sense of gravity and uh, the Pacific Ocean and the sound of the city, but also really modulating that space. And in many ways, these kind of scientific images led to the, some of the characteristics that the space has. But we're also very pragmatic. I mean, on the one hand, we are uh, scientific, and on the other hand, there's a, a kind of pragmatism which happens. And that's something that I think is important in work, that it's a combination of the precise and the random. It's a, the combination of the, the rational and the uh, intuition. And this image describes the, the fact that the building is a series of vertical strata which continually change as one moves along this kind of boomerang, boomerang uh, arena-shaped uh, site. And what that does is that means that each of these is different. Each vertical contour is different. And it makes a kind of necklace of, of, of elements uh, which, which uh, give form to a building on this uh, curving arena-shaped site. While we were thinking about these vertical strata and the control of the sun, we were also thinking about the horizontal strata because it's a big building. And there's the whole intention was to get that sense of how the university related to the city and how the city would somehow feel like it was seeping into the world of the uh, university. So we had three main social strata, which was the ground, level five, where the scale changes from large laboratories to small teaching spaces and the uh, loggia at roof level, which relates to, uh, to the library. And this is the way it manifests itself on the Barranco side, which is the uh, beautiful uh, low-rise, high-density uh, residential quarter. So in a sense, the, the two images describe the, um, the, the condition of two extremes meeting, the, the, the need to, to address the motorway at the scale of the city, but then on the other hand, the need to uh, respect the scale of the uh, beautiful housing quarter which exists. And so you see the, the, um, the strata of the ground, the level five, which is the main social um, garden level at the upper level, and then the, the building peters out to the, the top. So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of frag fragmentation of the form where it relates to the, to the housing. One of the things that building at this scale really makes us feel is that at a certain moment, uh, a, a, a building somehow develops a life of its own. It somehow takes off, and, and we are facilitators in that process. And again, we, we try to control things, but we can't control things at that scale, and we can't control things at that distance. But in this case, because we really thought about it as being like a piece of social infrastructure, and because, as Yvonne says, it doesn't have the normal requirements of thermal insulation, waterproofing, wind and rain, and all those things that we normally have to deal with, it had a robust quality, because it was like building a, a viaduct or a, 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 an aqueduct or something. But also what's amazing is to witness the, the um, incredible collective energy uh, at very high speed, which went into the making of, of this project. And, and it goes back to maybe something that Yvonne was said, saying that, that one of the jury asked us was, why did we 
use concrete for this project. And we just felt that it was the, the local material. There's more cement sold on the domestic market in, in Peru than in the commercial market because everybody builds their own house in concrete and they don't stop, they keep on going. And so it's, it's, it is their local indigenous kind of material and it's, it's cheap and it works. It works environmentally, it works structurally, it works in so many different ways because we're working in a, in a seismic, um, in a seismic uh, city and, and so it works from that point of view uh, as well. And um, again, what's, what's, what, what this project really reminded us about was the, was the the, the nature of concrete, we had to really think about how, how we could use the plastic quality of concrete, but at the same time, how we could make it buildable. And it has this very complex geometry at, at, at ground floor where, where we're building this kind of uh, protection against the motorway, where the building is floating. It's really two buildings, one floating above another, and this sits on the seismic isolators and to see the workers working out the, the formwork and the complex geometry of this site, we were just full of admiration and appreciation of the passion and the, and, and the love and the energy that they invested in this building. And one of the amazing things about concrete, just to go on a little about it, is um, the fact that the, the walls, the beams, the floors, when you're working in in situ concrete, what's, in, what's, what's fantastic is that it becomes monolithic. And it, it has this kind of ancient uh, quality uh, and, and this, this uh, monumental quality, let's call it. We're looking up to the, to, the, to the roof. One can't see the sky because of the way that the corbelling of the, of the section uh, works. And Yvonne spoke briefly about the the plan of the project, it's, uh, it's this series of uh, primary wall beams which happen every 20 metres with uh, intermediate supports every 10 metres. Uh, and we see the long section of the full extent of the project. The staircases, which like a, a stadium or an arena, are the escape stairs and form the primary stabilising structure. And uh, the, um, the, the, the geometry and the way that the geometry affects the, uh, the, 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 the form of the space. So you can never see from one end to the other. So while there's a rationale in the way that the structure is, is, is organized, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's much more three-dimensional in, in its reality because of the geometry of the site. So this is the ground floor plan and its relationship to uh, Barranco, which is the housing. And, and here we have the what we call the hostile uh, motorway. So the DNA of this project is the, uh, one could say, the vertical strata. And going back to this, this idea of, of an open-ended uh, way of thinking or looking for a looseness uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the thinking, but also in the space. Uh, when I say we're a combination of the, the, the pragmatic and the, and the rational, each one of these was, was a product of, of the rooms, the teaching rooms, the scale of rooms that, that it needed to support, the geometry of the site, and the whole thing of, of controlling the, uh, the leaning to the, to the north in terms of, um, in terms of providing the shade from, from, the, from the sun. Um, this next image, uh, which is probably the, the, just looking at the, the section in some detail. Uh, one of, Yvonne spoke about uh, Machu Picchu and Skellig Mill in, um, in Ireland. What we found really useful about the Venice Biennale in 2012 was that we had just won um, the, the Common Ground uh, Biennale. We had just won this competition, and so we used the Biennale as a way of somehow testing what was uh, an unformed uh, project. And so we started to look at those sections and to really research the, the landscape tradition of both Ireland and, and uh, Peru through those two monumental structures. But it was really because we were thinking about this as being uh, an element in, 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 uh, in, in a hostile landscape, from, in a sense, because you have the huge city uh, on the one side and, and the um, Barranco on the other. So there was this feeling of needing to make something which had a, a kind of heroic scale at the scale of the city, but at the same time to make um, spaces which had an intimacy 
and where the students could retreat into these teaching spaces and where they would enjoy gardens and, and the aspect to this leafy uh, place. And we, there was a, there's a very interesting essay by um, William Curtis on uh, Machu Picchu where he talks about platform and horizon and that idea of, of the intimate, uh, the needing to make something intimate within the very big landscape, in our case, the very big landscape uh, of the city. And this image it describes the effect of what I was speaking about, of this, this corbelling to protect from the sun, from the, from the north. But what really astonished us, uh, because we knew it was going to be, but not quite so um, strong, was that you, you're in a space where you've come through a perforate structure which feels very open, but because of the shading, you don't see the sky. So the building reaches to the to the to the sky reaches to the light, but you don't see the sky. The sky, so that gives this sense of uh, of the space being carved. The, these are the seismic idol isolators. So you have one building sitting on top of another, uh, moving, and luckily we haven't experienced that. It's something that is kind of terrifying. But again, Yvonne credited our engineers. What we found was that the engineering tradition in um, in, in Lima was, was, was second to none. And the way that these people built uh, uh, this building so fast was hugely impressive. These images describe the integration of the landscape, which is just starting to grow. The way the plan recedes in the footprint gets smaller as you move up. Uh, you see the, the plan going from being quite full with voids. Sometimes the bridges relate to the city. Sometimes you're circulating uh, directly in front of the classroom. So you're bridging, uh, you're bridging over and back between city and uh, the more intimate um, spaces related to the, uh, to the gardens. Um, one of the things I suppose we, we really think, feel is that the space in between, the in-between spaces are the key for us to, to architecture. In a sense, the space that hasn't been asked for. That space which maybe isn't specifically programmed, but um, that architecture can provide. The space where people move, the space where people uh, can converse, the space where, uh, where, where life can happen. And we really like a, a, a piece written by Walter Benjamin where he talks about the capacity of certain structures to act as a scaffold for a complex series of events not anticipated by the architect. And this has always been a sort of ambition for us to try to make, um, to make work which would have that not fully prescriptive quality, that it would have that kind of openness and that looseness and that that might lead to a certain uh, way of inhabiting buildings, which is maybe different to everything being prescribed and uh, controlled. And again, the view looking towards the, uh, the motorway and the little strips of uh, landscaping starting to, to, to develop, and the way that the, 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 the plan now, the accommodation now moves closer and closer to the motorway as it leans over to protect the lower floors from the from the sun. Again, for some years, uh, a, a book which we carry around since we've been uh, working in, in Milan is uh, Italian Thoughts by the Smithsons. And um, while they're talking about Siena in this piece, uh, an essay called um, Building of the Conglomerate Order, they're also talking about contemporary buildings and how contemporary buildings might learn from cities like Siena where you can't see where the ground stops and the building starts. And just to quote a few fragments from that essay, they say, a building of the conglomerate order seems natural. It harnesses all the senses. It can offer especially pleasures beyond those of the eyes. They are perhaps the pleasures of territory that the other animals feel so strongly. It has a spatial presence more awesome than that of object presence. It has a capacity to absorb spontaneous additions, subtractions, technical modifications without disturbing its sense of order. Indeed, such changes enhance it. It is an inextricable part of a larger fabric. And in a sense, that, what, that, that somehow expresses what we were trying 
uh, to do, to make the sense of a conglomerate which would connect with the city. This is Eduardo Hochschild, our client, at the inauguration of the building in December 2014. And this is Mario Vargas Llosa, the, um, uh, the Peruvian Nobel Prize winner. And Yvonne and I found this whole ceremony extremely moving because uh, we were intent on building this building, which we had to catch up with and move very fast in doing. Uh, and, and we hadn't really, I suppose, um, had a chance to hear or to discuss uh, these people talking at some length about their ambition both for, for Peru, uh, which uh, Mario Fargus Losa spoke very beautifully about, uh, he talked about the vision for Lima, the vision for Peru, and that the, um, that the main, that the key for the development of Peru and for Lima uh, was education for rich and poor. And uh, Eduardo Hochschild, whose father was a very important uh, presence in Lima, as a philanthropic presence in the making of technical schools, uh, has now picked up, Eduardo has picked up his father's um, uh, his father's idea and uh, moved on to the next layer in making a university of engineering. He's a, a mining engineer with uh, an impressive uh, vision for education. Uh, we found that there was a generosity of spirit in the way that they think about making a university. It's a, as I say, it's a university of engineering. He talks that day about the importance of art and creativity in engineering how important it was that each engineer would have art classes and classes in the humanities as well as in engineering and that creativity shouldn't be restricted as being uh, restricted, that somehow the, the kind of different disciplines shouldn't be uh, kept apart. They also talked about the scholarship um, system they have and the ambition to really provide education for rich and poor in what is indeed uh, a poor city. And the way they spoke to us when we were making this building was uh, they spoke about making that we should try to make a place where every student would find his or her own place, be it in a group or be it alone, that somehow um, that, that there would be a place for everybody. And we were, very, again, very touched by this, that, that they were really thinking about about how the student would feel, how the student would feel when alone, or how the student would feel in a group, how the underprivileged student might be able to find a place in this, um, this vertical uh, infrastructure, let's call it. Uh, the view from the, the bridges, I mean, one of the things, again, the key things, is we exposed all the laboratories to vision, that, that there's this sense of visibility, so you're looking through the laboratories from a bridge, and you can start to see some of the little um, ter the little courtyards which are developing between clusters of four laboratories at the upper level. So the the landscaping is 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 uh, embedded in the crevices uh, of the the project. And and one of the things that we believe about education is education happens um, in terms of the way that one formally absorbs. Uh, information, but it, it's also an, a university is a place of discovery, and sometimes the most important discoveries are made by something you see out of the corner of your eye, which um, ignites the imagination, or by overhearing a conversation. Um, the student alone enjoying her relationship with the city as she uh, thinks whatever she's thinking about, or dreams whatever she's dreaming about. Uh, one of the other things that we are really interested in terms of making architecture is uh, the, the, the integral part that structure plays in the making of space. That somehow it's not that we make a space and find a structure, that we make a structure and that makes a space. And we, we love that sense, uh, that ancient sense of moving within the forces of gravity, that somehow you feel the sense of weight being borne down or, or, or being, uh, being supported. And that, 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 that sense of moving within the forces of gravity for us is, is a very primal uh, sort of um, need or a primal enjoyment in, 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 in architecture. This is, the, again, the, the image which probably most clearly describes this, this sense of the corbelling, of the, 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 the underside, the, what Yvonne called the undercroft of the stadium, in a sense, that, that you make this kind of structure which is about making a comfortable microclimate in this place, and that part of that 
thinking, which is to do with structures, to do with the scientific modulation of light and shade, and that leads to a space that you couldn't design consciously as setting out to design it. It's a product of, of that thinking, and that's something we find really refreshing and uh, surprising, that it's not that we designed it like this, it's that it happened like this, in a sense. And the, the moon and the sun and the skies in, in Lima are, are wonderful. And uh, one of the things we love is the way that the soft breeze of the Pacific Ocean blows through the voids of the Utec building and that it brings with it the sounds and the smells of the enormous city in which uh, it stands. And we love this, um, this image which we received from a stranger it's uh, it received it in the uh, by email, the newspaper one of the newspapers in Lima, and it says the best building in the world is Peruvian, and we were really uh, pleased when we when we got that because somehow it made us feel that they had made this building their own, but it also I think describes the importance of this award for this building at this moment in time. We are I'm going to, I think we're going to, for the next few minutes, just uh, to, we commissioned this film uh, for the Venice Biennale. Uh, it, it begins in the Celtic way, where the day begins at night, so the moon is rising, and this is Utec. And I suppose what's important for us to share with you tonight is that you've seen 14 slices of structure You've seen a kind of a banana-shaped plan with the shifting uh, site, but that in the end, a building positions itself within a place. And we chose four characters that you'll see coming from the various parts of Lima. They will come to this building doing their various jobs or studying or whatever. And we're happy to share with you the kind of uh, nighttime, the wall that Shelley describes, and the the setting or the rising sun which obviously arise, <laughs> rises in the east also in Peru and sets in the west but it's a city of contrast and we have a person leaving her home coming to help keep the dust of the desert from all the shelves and outer ledges that we've created this person has to pick up the pieces on her behalf but it's interesting, I think, to share with, with people kind of uh, uh, intensity and variety of the people in Lima, how they go about their daily life. So here's somebody. It's interesting, I think we often talk about it. We spend our time as architects making buildings. These are people making their own buildings on uh, cliff tops and edges, uh, eking out their lives bringing you in by the breeze, you're on the breeze coming in from the um, Pacific. I mean, it's a great honor. We can't believe we're standing here tonight, guys. This is an amazing experience for us and for the people of UTEC and for all the people involved that it's got the, the award from uh, Reba of the International Prize. It is truly moving that, that this kind of sing, listen to these birds of, of Lima. You can hear this, this guy in the background. And here is our, our, our dust collector arriving in, into our building. We used a very interesting, there are fantastic architects in, in Lima, and they very kindly gave us the, uh, the space for a, a, a finish on the, on the concrete floor. Um, so we've used it on the, on the first level, the ground level, and then on level five, which Shelley pointed out as the, um, as the main garden level before you go onto the roof. And as we say, there is dust everywhere in Lima. It's a lifetime job, I think. A busy motorway in the city. There are four characters in the film. Um, the, the, the Shell, do you want to describe them? Yeah, this is one of the students, uh, we mapped his way from his house to uh, the more salubrious parts of Lima. So you've just seen the lady coming from 
uh, the spontaneous housing schemes which happen all around the city. Uh, and this guy comes from a different quarter of cycling to, um, to the university. Uh, I think what's important is that those two images show how important it is the, the, uh, this whole scholarship system is that, that, um, that UTEC have in place, where uh, students are supported in getting an education if they have the wish or the ambition or the intelligence to do so. And uh, they're very serious about this system and they're very serious about the integration of the rich and poor into the life of the, uh, of the university. You can see from these um, shots that it's not, it is really a, a skeletal structure. Uh, all the services are exposed. Uh, there's, there's no linings, there's no insulation. It is a kind of a scaffold. Uh, for life, so to speak, and um, it's a growing university. It's not full. Uh, it's not fully finished in terms of the, the landscaping. And, and the, the educational vision that we spoke about, um, we presume, will be uh, put in place. And I suppose what we realized on that day of the inauguration is that it, it wasn't just a building that was being designed. It was a whole curriculum, a whole way of teaching, which they were uh, instigating and which they were really uh, promoting in a very progressive and uh, generous way. Uh, one of the things, it just it's not related to this image, but when we did the competition we were worried about the colour of the concrete and that it wouldn't match the colour of the cliff. And what we discovered, oh this is Yvonne's character, sorry, I'll finish in a moment. What we, what we discovered was that the concrete, over a period of time, assumes the colour of the, of the desert because the city is so dusty. And all the concrete buildings we saw in Lima from the 60s had become this kind of yellowy, dusty colour because the, the dust of the desert adheres to the concrete. So we thought that was nice, that that would happen, that the colour would change over time. Uh, the, the issue of the layering. I mean, South America, parts of South America and in cities, there, uh, there is a... a, a the need to layer in terms of security. So the, the issue of entering into this kind of campus is controlled. Um, do you see uh, one of the professors moving through the various um, uh, layers? I think architecturally and the kind of single material, what we find it's really like a carved, it really is like a carved mountain. It, it feels like a, a single solid carved. And what, it, what we found extraordinary, I suppose each project for architects is kind of an experiment, that setting up these uh, kind of salami pieces, you would imagine, and that's what we like uh, about the film, is that it kind of brings it alive, that it isn't a, a boomerang with 14 pieces, with the student only um, appearing every now and again. It is, a, it is a place that sits in this city, um, allows, as Shell says, the, the breeze to come through, the landscape over years. I mean, it would be fantastic to imagine this project in a hundred years' time when the Bourgainvillea is perfectly uh, settled, that the lusciousness of the landscape and uh, growth in this part of the world really inhabits the building as well as the bird life. This is the library, students in the library. And we really do want students to be aware that they're Peruvian, that this is a, a Peruvian place, that it's not, uh, you know, three or four towers where you could press a, 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 a lift button and go up and down into your uh, lecture halls, that each time you move from inside to outside, that you're thrown, your vision is thrown to the Andes and the Pacific, as well as to your colleagues. I mean, these kids on their mobile phones are probably not thinking the things that we're trying, trying to say. <laughs> they probably just want to go and have a bit of fun. So the struggle as an architect, I suppose, is really how do you set up a framework where the architecture kind of steps back? Do you want to talk about your guy going home, Pastor Waka? Yeah. <laughs> no, you, yeah, OK. And then this is the night watchman uh, on his way to work. And uh, Yvonne touched on the security issues in Lima. I mean, we were really quite shocked in the beginning. Uh, that it's a dangerous city. Uh, it has had very recent and very severe political problems. But one day, the uh, UTEC said to us, we're, we're going to do what you said. We're going to open up the university to the city. We're going to have gates which can open. 
Is that the film? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're going to have um, gates which, uh, which we will open as much as we can. I think that is, in reality, probably will take some time to have to, to monitor that in terms of how this building settles in to the, to the city. So the issue of control, as Yvonne is saying, in terms of layers of, of, of giving that sense of openness, of having gates which open and shut, of, of giving the, the facility in the long term for the, for the building to open its doors uh, to fully to the, to the surrounding uh, community and to the round, surrounding city. The skies are really amazing because of the fog. The skies, both in terms of the rising and setting sun and the moon, become red, red, red. And uh, that's something we really wanted to capture in that drawing I showed you, where the orange sky is in the background. We were trying to see how we could frame that orange sky uh, at night when you're working in the building. So this is the entrance from Barranco, uh, which is the housing quarter we spoke about and then how I mean, we also thought it was interesting that it would have this kind of sense of transparency at night and that it would feel like a sort of beehive of, of energy where the, 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 the work of the, the, the engineers and the experimentation in the laboratories would happen and how it takes the I mean that, that highway is, is extraordinary it's kind of um, we just couldn't understand how we could possibly build on that edge but one of the reasons why the university chose that site, which has complications, but because they wanted to be present in the city. So it has a 360 meter frontage, but it's very long and skinny, but they really wanted to have a presence at the scale of the city, this new university coming uh, to Lima. Many people ask what it is. Is it housing? Is it a football stadium? What is it? But in a way, we enjoy that kind of blurring of typological thinking. Thank you. Thank you. That was really, really amazing. Um, I, I'm, I'm wanting to open up to some questions so that we have some roving mics um, for those that would like to ask questions. Um, would you like to put your hands up? I've got one. I'm desperate to ask you a question. But um, Is there anybody here who would like to ask a question and get, this, get the party started? We've got about 10 minutes. So we can have some questions from the floor. Right, good. That gives me the opportunity. What I'm in, absolutely intrigued about is the way that you work which seems to me like every, every time you start something, it's a research project. You're not so much thinking about the architecture as thinking about the context and, and the site and the history and the people. It, it, it feels to me like a research project, that you don't know what you're doing yet, that you start by thinking of a, of a bigger picture. Is that how you do it in reality? It's certainly true that we don't know what we're doing yet. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it like that, honestly. No, but it's true, and that's, that is the kind of scary thing. I think that's why architects remain humbled and anchored all of their lives, because you, you start each time not really knowing what to do. And clients don't like to hear that, so we don't tell them very often. <laughs> but, but it is the case. But it's also a very creative thing. And we have to say that we have a really fantastic creative team of people. It's not just Yvonne and myself, people who are um, um, exploratory, who have very different skills, who are highly imaginative. And we try at the beginning of a competition to open it up to the office and to say that we don't have a couple of people in the corner doing the competition. We say, okay, what is this thing? What do we do? And so I think that openness of the discussion helps us to try and find try and find the 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 key the the key to how uh, one could progress the the project and and that's something we really enjoy even though it, it is tense it it can be difficult uh, it, it, it you know it's it's not that always that easy to manage the ideas don't always come at the right time or soon enough 
And, and so, it, but we do think that that sense of openness is, it's also to do with the way we think about making architecture, that it's not a closed, tight thing, but somehow we need to have a kind of a looseness in, in order to really find what the project is trying to be. I, it's a really important question. Um, I think that what is in each project, in all the architects in the room or all the architects in the world, is that there is a huge responsibility that each project is not a product that comes preformed. That each, especially listening to David Attenborough, let's say, that you see the earth that we're making more. I mean, that issue where we discuss you know, that architecture is a new geography. They're not just words that we kind of find a kind of a theory. That is a real responsibility. And that each project, no matter how small, is in fact using resources, um, you know, carving quarries to make the stone, using up the resources of the earth, and also costing a fortune, like sustainability. We had a very interesting conversation with the journalist earlier on this evening in terms of sustainability. Sustainability isn't just something you clip on with a few radiators or solar panels on a roof and a bit of a bush sticking out of a building that's kind of landscape. That is really, that's why we say that sustainability is it's really the, the physics of culture or the culture of physics, it's, but they're inter, we are architects, we have to be careful of the name that we call our profession, because we're really, um, if you like, scientists that invent a space in which life happens, and that it's not about, uh, you know, a, a, a box with beautiful ribbons on it, and that's architecture. Architecture is a much more socially uh, responsible uh, discipline, it's an art form that's useful and that it has to be useful and it has to be, have an art component to be architecture. It's not just building. The problem with much of the earth is that the commercial pressures make buildings not thoughtful. They're actually produced as products without judgment of scale. Like projects have to be judged. And as Shelley said, the, the capacity within our office to make models, to study, to view, to make perspective, to try and judge. What I find amazing about this project for us, I mean, this project is a kind of a surprise to us as well, because they were, they built it at enormous speed. There were 900 workmen on site making this project. It was incredible. It was like watching a, uh, a medieval cathedral being built. And there was a beautiful thing, which we didn't mention, but a beautiful thing, so slightly, I'm slightly digressing, but when they were going on site to make this project, I presume they didn't know what they were doing, they were just doing one bit of the walls or whatever, but there was a mirror just as you enter the site, and we asked the uh, project manager, what is the mirror doing as the workmen enter? And he said, it's a mirror to r remind each workman that he has a contribution to make to this project. <coughs> And we just thought this was a beautiful, simple way to say that everybody matters. And to your question about context and making and all involved, it's not only the team here, it's the client's ability to understand that some competitions mean more than others, and also to, for us to challenge the commerciality of life, that the earth is more than just a return on square footage or square meterage that it has a cultural value, a real cultural value. And it's only when we see things destroyed, the dreams of people destroyed, that you realize how important architecture is. I think that says it all, isn't it? Um, are there any other questions? Would anybody like to ask something? Um, this is a gentleman in front here. So we've got some roving mics. If you'd like to bring one around. Here it comes, here it comes. Thanks. Um, it seems to me that when you talk about strategic thinking that in a way you're referring to a kind of tradition of buildings which, I mean, the Colosseum in Rome was occupied for, for generations, the Theatre of Marcellus was occupied, um, that your building has sort of comes out of that. It's a wonderful building, uh, but it seems to me that the, the great strength it has is, is it that it refers to a tradition uh, of uh, kind of big, of big buildings which can then adapt to all manner of different uh, occupation. Um, and I also think that, you know, if we think of Hard Bracken in the 1960s and the whole idea of support structures, that that also sort of feeds into the, to the richness of the idea. I think that um, the, the issue of 
things kind of happen as well. The site was narrow, the requirements were very intense to supply them with a, with a university. Our in analysis of it, things kind of happen, one thing nudges another. It doesn't, um, if they had a big site, you know, that was enormous somewhere else, you'd imagine a campus being designed in a different way. We were given a tiny boomerang with a, with a really, really tough motorway on one side. And we, it was a struggle. You see, the, the struggle and the, the kind of components of place actually give something life. And that uh, if we'd had a square site somewhere in, you know, in Shropshire and you needed something, it would be different. This is South America. It's uh, a, a, a university that's beginning. So we could invent. It wasn't, you know, uh, adding on to Oxford and Cambridge with those hugely established. This was the pressures were enormous, and the site, and, and Shelley referred to it, I think is really important, and we had it up, the drawings during the competition, and somebody came in the office, and we said, oh, it's a school of engineering, and they said, oh, it looks like a school of engineering, all right. That there's also symbolism, that this kind of strength, I mean, engineers carve out of mountains to make. So we were kind of making a mountain to give back, you know, that there's, it was also practical things of, uh, you know, safety staircases and getting people up and down. Like, uh, the, the point of, the wonderful thing about architecture is that it hovers between the insanely practical and some other component, whatever that thing is, it's some little spark that goes into another world. And for us, when the scaffolding came down, when we were walking through the space for the first time, we looked at one another and kind of went, it has more presence and we're, the, the, the work of, or the writings of uh, Johannes Palasma describe, you know, the, 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 that architecture affects our skin, not just our minds. I mean, we're talking here tonight and we bring you a film, which is the nearest physicality we can bring in a room in London on a, on a December night. You, you could invite us all over there. We'll all come. Pisco Sours on the fifth floor. But the, the, physical, the physical reality of the weight of the concrete, Shelley touched on it there about the kind of sense of weight bearing down. There's something, uh, the physicality of it is more than we expected. I think it's true to say, it's a bit like in, in Bocconi, I don't know whether you know, or there's a, an, an Aula Magna which can't leave us 22 meters. And that carved into the city of Milan has a more primitive uh, physical relationship to you as you stand there than we imagined. And that kind of happened by one thing leading to another as well. So I think the, the I mean, it's, it's to link it with, the, uh, with, with Rome is very complimentary, thank you. Uh, but I think things happen, things happen. We were trying to shade the sun. We were trying to do other things and this thing develops. So the sketch of the busy motorway, the quiet barranco, the big things, the small things, it's a way of, going back to Jane's original question, you kind of have all these kind of things as an architect. I think that's what happens in the office. And we kind of uh, play in, in the real sense that imagination is about invention, not about doing a product. We, as we said, we don't know what happens, but something happens as the story unfolds. Thank you. Have we got time for one more? One more. Okay, there was one on this side. Sorry, no. I'm, I'm sorry, Greg, your, your microphone's not very... What do I have to do? You, you Speak have more to take clearly. A... How about that? Is that better? Okay. Um, I just wanted to uh, pursue this question uh, and perhaps ask you what your thoughts are about the effect of time on the building. Um, you describe very beautifully about how it is of its place, how it is of a geography and how it is a geography. Um, and um, of course, nature changes, uh, as we're acutely aware at the moment. Uh, and Humboldt himself talks of change and the effect of time on everything. Um, this building will evolve, uh, but it is concrete. Is there a conflict there, or do you see it growing and changing? Well, there's 20 meter spans, and then there's 10 meter intermediate structure, and there's infill walls, which are precast concrete. So they're not primary structure. 
So there's primary structure and secondary structure. So there is ability to, for instance, move walls or change them without the affecting the primary structure. Um, when we talk about flexibility and things being, uh, I suppose, open to change, sometimes it does involve adjusting the building. I'm just thinking in general, because another thing the Smithsons often said, which, which we thought was, we think is really interesting, is that the most flexible structures are the ones that are most precisely designed to suit a particular function. That is not about making neutral space. And that in some ways, neutral space is very often not so flexible. So when you make something very specific, it can adapt, it can be inhabited differently. And it was interesting when in the Venice Biennale, some colleagues of ours from, um, from Belgium came in and saw the big photographs in the room and they said, what is it? Is it housing? And we said, no. And they said, well, it could be housing. And uh, we said, it's a university. And he said, is it finished? <laughs> and that was an architect. And um, we, we thought, well, yeah, that's nice. There was a really nice, it was a really nice compliment uh, to say that he didn't know what it was designed for and he didn't know it was, if it was finished. And he went on to talk about, you know, you could have a mixing of housing mixed with a university. It could be adjusted, you know, it could be... An, it could, so there's the thing of how you inhabit a place and also then how... I don't think it's just about how much it needs to change, but how could... Could you move in and live in it? Could you? I could. could you know. I could. <laughs> can I just add? Can I just add to that? I think that uh, it's something that is kind of implicit in all the discussion tonight. Is that you know uh, when architecture and uh, and engineering, structural engineering, kind of split as kind of studying disciplines, it was a real tragic time for humanity, really, because what happens now is that it tends to be very interesting structure, and then it gets wrapped up and wrapped and wrapped, and it's gone. Really, what the, the kind of use of a, of a of an infrastructure like this is to say that that these are platforms on which things happen, and in terms of time, when you when you talk about time, I'm imagining 150 years from now, and the Bourgonvillea is completely. You have to hack your way into the the laboratories to get to to look at some experiment. Then that's successful. I I think that it could be. You could imagine it is kind of a ruin. It is. Uh, um, somebody, a friend of mine, described it as a as a ghost ship in porcelain, which I thought was a very beautiful description. That that change change will happen. But I think that. Um, working, uh, it's a seismic area, so it's on these, uh, hu it will shudder and move if there are earthquakes, so hopefully it survives, we trust our engineers. I think the time, I think it will be covered in, in birds and plants, that's a romantic view. The other might be that the university, uh, what, what I think is really important about the, the oh, fact... Oh, go on, says, what, what was the option? I leave it hanging. The, the, just the fact that education. I think what's interesting for us is that at that education is not. There isn't a formula for education. That this is a section where you look at the city and you look at your colleague and you see into a laboratory. So it's it's taking a, a place where that that girl leaning on a on a bridge looking out over Lima, that you were reminded that you were a citizen of a city of the earth. You're not in hermetically sealed, vertical, I press the lift, I go up, I'm inside in a sealed thing. I think what we like is that the breeze affects your skin and that you're reminded you are a human being with responsibilities. And, and I mean, the, what we were amazed, I think, is that the client said, yeah, grant, off you go. They supported it totally, this kind of crazy thing. And that's what's really important about this award, that it endorses risk. And I would like to thank, again, this award means so much to so many people. I, I think I better give it to you. <laughs> the award. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sure you'll agree with me that that was just the most fantastic presentation. Thank you so much, Shelley. Thank you very much. Richard, would you be lovely and come and join us?
Um, Richard, you have the easy job, and there's a certificate on the table there, which is yours to give, and uh, I've got the fun job. I need my muscles for this one. It's my great pleasure to finish this evening while they're chatting. Uh, Richard, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being an absolutely magnificent chair of the inaugural International Prize and for your inspiring words earlier. Thank you. And um, it's been such a delight to offer this wonderful new award to such fantastic architects, such inspiration for everybody here. And uh, on that note, thank you all. But... Um, don't go, come along upstairs and let's share the joy in this occasion and uh, raise a glass to our new international prize winners. <laughs>